So let's get into it. What is this? This is an introduction to defensive programming. And the way we're going to start this is by starting with what this isn't. This isn't an introduction to programming. This isn't going to be detailed analysis on how to do things with programming. Really what this is is to give you all an idea of some of the dangers that can be presented to you as a computer programmer, things that you need to keep an eye out for, and things that could potentially happen. In addition to that, we're also going to go over a couple of other things. Uh, I'm sure everybody knows about uh, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Hutchinson. Uh, he was arrested at DEF CON, um, or shortly after DEF CON. Uh, after that gentleman got arrested, there was a whole bunch of stuff that ended up in the newspaper. We're going to talk about that a little bit. He's connected in a way to uh, WannaCry and WannaCrypt, so I do want to discuss that. And then for those of you who made it to last talk, we talked about things like Hansa Market, Alpha Bay, places where people are going to buy heroin online, uh, the way that they're using some of these cryptocurrencies to be able to make illicit purchases online. Uh, I want to make some announcements about what actually occurred over the past few days in relation to uh, some of those events. But let's start with our performance objectives. So at the conclusion of this course, you will be able to identify why coding is the backbone of security. You will be able to identify an organization that provides unbiased information about internet and computer applications and the security therein. You will be able to identify what phase of software development lends itself to finding vulnerabilities in the code. We will be able to talk about what is a buffer overflow and what does DRY stand for, D-R-Y. Okay. So let's just start with software. Your hardware really doesn't do much for you if you don't have something to run on it. We can go out and we can buy a computer and we can put $4,000 worth of hardware in this box and we can plug it into the wall and give it power and we can let it sit there and generally Unless somebody kicks in the door and picks this thing up, it poses no real threat to anybody, and nothing bad's going to happen with it. But once we add an operating system, and once we ask that system to start doing stuff, well, that's when we start having to pay attention to it. Perhaps we're going to add a web browser, or I'm sorry, not a web browser, a web server. Uh, perhaps we're going to add a database, or we're going to have it do something. Once it starts doing something, that's when it can present a threat to us. So when I'm working with my students, in general, what I like to tell them is the techniques that we're learning, you need to be able to pay attention and learn these techniques because they will do something positive for you. But in addition to that, you need to learn how they can hurt you. We can RM a file. Take a file and we can run the command RM and we can remove that file and that's great. But when you run rm space dash rf space forward slash and you do it as sudo, well, then potentially that's harmed us, right? So you have this tool that can easily remove files and free up space and that's okay, or you can accidentally wipe out the entire system. So we need to not only understand how the hardware works, how the software works, how all of these items come together to provide us some sort of service, whatever that service happens to be. But in addition to that, we also need to make sure that we're paying attention to how these services could harm us. Just like the Internet of Things, everybody knows that buzzword, right? Internet of Things. Everybody's buying cameras, they're buying DVRs, they're buying drones. Drones are the big thing in the, the news right now, DJI, right? Everybody went out and bought drones, and the next thing you know, everybody's going, why is this thing connecting to China? I'm communicating with servers all over the world from this little drone that's taking pictures of the inside of my house or whatever. So where's all this information actually going? But that's an invisible function, right? We buy this device and we use it and in the background it's doing something else. Uh, another one, Roombas, anybody see that? Everybody bought little robots, right? And they put them in their house and the robot went around and cleaned and that was super cool and super awesome. 
And now what are they doing? They gathered up maps of people's houses. They gathered up sensor data about the homes. They gathered up a ton of information. And again, for those of you who have previously come to my classes, what are some of the things we could do with that kind of information? Have you thought about that? We thought it, we, uh, one of the thought exercises that I gave in one of my previous classes was entropy, right? 33 bits of entropy and I can pretty much figure out who you are, no matter where you are or who you are. As long as I have very specific bits of information about you, even though that data is anonymous information, at a certain point with enough anonymous information, it's no longer anonymous, right? Your Roombas are doing the exact same thing. But at the end of the day, what happened? Somebody wrote a program, right? And that program was designed to do something really neat, and then they exploited it. So let's go over some code concepts first, OK? Just for those of you who are developers, who work in software, who have to do anything involving computers. The first thing that we need to pay attention to when we're talking about code is that code needs to be correct first. If the code can't do its job, if the expected behavior of that code is wrong, or if it's not accomplishing the mission, that's a problem, right? I see a lot of people, whenever I'm working with other developers or individuals who are dealing with code, they get into this idea that they want it to be performant. They want to use fancy tricks and neat things, right? I want to impress my peers. I want to show people how cool it is that I can use specific functions or frameworks, or I can do all of these different things without really paying attention to what's going on in the system. Now, of course, you can also take that to the extreme. Uh, case in point, at my current position, we have a piece of software that we work with that was developed in-house. And when I got there, uh, it is a web application. And that web application loaded 649 megabytes per page load on the server side. Okay, there was composer use, there was a whole bunch of other stuff, and this was all in WordPress, and essentially WordPress loads a whole bunch of things, and then you had all these plugins that were loading, and none of it was loaded in a way that, uh, that wasn't loaded on page load, like it wasn't on demand. It literally took the entire web application and just span it all up. Response times was 30 seconds when you would click on a page, like you'd click home, and it would take 30 seconds, and then it would come up. And then you'd click on the next page that you wanted to go to, it was another 30 seconds. And I added op caching, operations caching. So it only loads that up one time, and it dropped us down to about 0 0.5 seconds. Okay? So there's a problem with the code, but then there was a Band-Aid that we could apply on system side. And then once we did that, and we added the Band-Aid, now the system loads and people can actually use it. Getting fancy, trying to be impressive, adding a whole bunch of stuff on the back end, all of those things can potentially spawn problems. And in addition to that, and we'll, we'll talk about this here shortly, the more things that you add into the code, remember, those are more things that you need to check, that you need to look at, that you need to be cognizant of. For every line that's written into this thing, that's one more line that we have to be concerned about, right? Uh, I have a really good story about that. I worked with a gentleman who, uh, his big story was that um, he went into a job and they used to pay by the line of code. Per line, that's how you got paid, okay? So you'd sit down and if you were writing software, you got bucks for every line of code that you wrote. Obviously, people sat down and would write big, huge, programs to do very small things. And this guy sat down and said, you know what we're going to do? I'm going to start ripping all this stuff out and refactoring the code, making changes. And we're going to make it smaller, more compact, faster. We're going to do all this stuff. And he said that at the end of the day, he had pulled out thousands of lines of code and all of this stuff. And he had this huge thing. And he sent in a bill and said, for taking all this stuff out, I want even more money. Because now we're fixing your product. So. 
when you're sitting here coding or when you are sitting here being a developer, remember, nobody gets paid by the line anymore. At least I hope so. We want to make sure that what we're doing is we're writing stuff that's readable, that it's compact, that it's easy to maintain. And another term that we'll use is testable. So we can actually look at writing automated tests for verifying that these things are OK. Um, we'll talk about that here in a little bit when we talk about SQL injection. Writing clever code does not protect you. I don't care how clever your code is. It does not matter because somebody's still going to be able to go in there and find issues with it. Okay? But let's start with some of these vulnerabilities. And this one's really neat. This one is a buffer overflow. This is going to be the first vulnerability that we're going to talk about. And I've got a really famous buffer overflow for all of you that we can discuss. And that's going to be Eternal Blue. Everybody heard about Eternal Blue so far? Anybody not hear about Eternal Blue yet? No? Okay. So Eternal Blue is a vulnerability that was found in SMB since SMB version 1.0, which is pretty far back. SMB, uh, it's essentially like a Microsoft file sharing system. So Microsoft has been using this for a long time. And apparently this code was also reused in other places. So it didn't just affect Microsoft software. Okay? But uh, if you go to the web page, and you know what? I'm sorry, I didn't announce it. If you actually go to retro64xyz.github.io, can I? Nope, I can't zoom in at the top up there. But if you go there, you can actually follow along, and I have links. So I have the actual Metasploit. Um, file here, and this is off of GitHub, so you can actually follow along, and you can use this, especially if you're familiar with Metasploit, you can actually test this stuff. So, and of course, we'll get to Steve Ballmer here in a little bit. Retro64 XYZ dot GitHub dot IO. So back to Eternal Blue. So you can go there, you can check out the Metasploit, you can see everything involving this. But essentially what this was, was a vulnerability in SMB that when you actually exploit this, it allows you to run code on the server. Okay, This was a buffer overflow that allowed for remote code execution. This is a super big deal. In addition, does anybody know where Eternal Blue came from? Who was using this? Who was running around with this? Want to give me a name? Uh, Correct. Vault 7 NSA. So the NSA had access to this essentially since SMB version 1.0. And this was a tool that allowed them, if you were running SMB on your hardware, which I'm going to take a wild guess and say that the vast majority of people who are running Windows-based servers were also running SMB. Okay, there are there were very few Windows servers that were not running SMB. So using this technique, they could send code to the server, and then eventually force that server to run code, run applications to cause things to happen on that server. And there's a bit of a breakdown here. And what is actually happening is there's a mathematical error. And that's where a D word is subtracted into a word. Now, when I say D word into a word, for those of you who are not um, familiar with programming, in programming, when you were a software developer, especially when you're dealing with something like C or C++, not so much in PHP, but we'll get into that here in a second. If you're working with one of these languages, you actually have to declare a type for your variables. Okay, And so what you're doing is you're saying, maybe I have an integer. And that integer is, is, is of a fixed size. And when you declare that integer and say, OK, I have an integer, and that integer is the number 8, then you are declaring a certain space in memory. 
and you're putting an eight inside of that space. Okay? And that's the most basic place that we can put it. Um, we're down up there. So a D word is of a specific size, and it's actually a 32-bit uh, variable. A word is 16-bit. Now, what they're using is a function called memmove. Inside the code, they were using a function. That function was called memmove. And what that does is essentially a copy. You take a copy of a variable, and you can move that variable in memory. So you can say, uh, let's say that the address is address A, and I want to move address A actually to address B. Then we can use memmove to move that variable from A to B. But they need to be the same size. And that's very, very important. And I actually took a copy right here. And you can see memmove. There's a link for those of you who are following along. You can go to the memmove, and you can actually see the function. Copies the values of num bytes from the location pointed by source to the memory block pointed by destination. Source to destination. Okay? And copying takes place as if an intermediate buffer was used, allowing the destination and source to overlap so that you don't have to have a full uh, space between the two memory addresses. But there's a very, very important part that I want to get to down here at the bottom where it says in plain letters, if you want to avoid overflows, the size of the arrays pointed by both the destination and source parameters shall be at least num bytes. That's a really fancy way of saying that those two variables need to essentially be declared as the same size. Okay? You can't mim move from int to long int or long int to int. Okay? You can't have one that's really big and then one that's small and try to move them around because they're not going to fit. Think of it almost like Legos. Okay? You have, uh, you have one Lego, you have another Lego. If they're not the same size, they don't line up. Because they were able to locate this error in the code, which has been there for a very long time, they were then later able to um, force the system to execute code. This is a big deal. Remote execution is probably our number one fear in terms of security. If somebody gets access to your server, you can do what amounts to anything. Okay? Are we okay? Do I need to pause? Okay. Now, I want to talk about the buffer. I want to talk about pointers. And I want to give you a few concepts about the buffer before we continue to kind of help this set in and to give you all a little bit more um, information about how this works. So a pointer is used to assign the memory address value of a variable to a variable. You're going to use a variable to reference where a variable is being stored in memory. So we're not referencing the contents. We're actually re referencing the address. Okay. This right here is an example. And all of this code, all of my code um, examples, are going to be written in C. So you can actually follow along if you want to copy and paste this and dump this into Atom or whatever it is that your compiler slash um, text editor of choice is. So if you want to jump in there in Vim, copy and paste this, dump it into Vim, save it as a, a C file, and then use GCC to compile this stuff, you can actually follow along and see this. We declare an integer, var1. And then we use printf. And all we're saying is, is the address of var1 is, and you see that, ans that ampersand right there? We're referencing the memory address, the pointer. Okay? And that's a complete line. That's a complete main. Okay? And all it does is return an address. And it can be an example, like bff5a200. So that's where var1 currently lives. That's the address. And you can reference these things through pointers. And this is what's happening essentially up here is they're referencing the addresses and they're moving objects by address. Okay? So the next thing is we're going to talk about the buffer. 
And there's a whole bunch of text here, but let's break the buffer down into something really, really easy. Think of yourself sitting there and you want to eat some candy. And so you have a bag of candy, right? And if you were to stick your hand in that bag of candy and just start stuffing your face, your mom would get mad, right? So what do you do? You get a bowl. And you take a handful of candy and you put it in the bowl and then you draw pieces of candy from the bowl. The bowl is our buffer. That right there is where we're supposed to get information from. Because if you don't, you're going to get in trouble. Easy way to break it down, right? So a buffer overflow happens when software tries to continue writing past the start or end of the buffer. You're reaching somewhere else. Okay? We're starting to pick up knickknacks, try to put them in our mouth. It's not the candy out of the bowl. It's coming from somewhere else. So a buffer overflow or buffer underflow happens in either the stack or the heap. And we'll get to the stack here in a little bit. What happens if we have a problem in the buffer? Well, we just saw a major problem, right? Eternal blue, remote code execution. It's a big issue, right? But what's a simpler way to start testing for problems? Well, we're looking for crashes. We want the system to fail. And for us to find that failure, that's what we're looking for. But in addition to that, there could be a compromise, a leak of information. We could potentially, um, we could potentially output information that we should not be outputting, gather data from the memory, and then put it out there. Anybody want to name a company who had a issue similar to that fairly recently? Cloudflare. They were caching data and Individuals could swoop in and grab that information out, print it to the screen, gather it. That turned into a big deal. Uh, Google got involved on that one because Google was caching Cloudflare, layer, Cloudflare information. And so you could still go to Google and pull out people's usernames and passwords and stuff like that. That was kind of a mess, right? And then, of course, I reference again Make it that foothold. Once we find out that we can cause a program to crash, or we can cause it to exit out through the memory, then what are we going to do? We're going to look for privilege, privilege escalation. We're looking for an opportunity to, to wrangle this into us gaining illicit access or forcing the system to do something for us. So very important concepts about the buffer, both the stack and the heap both reside in the RAM and disk of the computer running the code. Okay, So when we talk about stack or we talk about heap, it's in RAM, it's on disk. The stack is a last in, first out data storage space that is built to handle a single call to a function, a block, a method, or the equivalent object. So if I make a function and that function at that point in code as the code is being run and we hit that function, guess what? That function is inside the stack. Okay? And this is just a way of managing memory. There's no like magic. There's nothing really super complicated about it. Pretty much everybody in here and probably anybody watching this video has at one time taken a RAM stick and put it inside of a computer. This is just us accessing that RAM stick in software as opposed to doing it by hand. So if you've accessed RAM, by picking it up and sticking it inside of a computer, here you go. Here's an opportunity to do the exact same thing in the computer. You're just adding things to RAM, taking it out, making things right to disk, taking it off of the disk. No more. So right here is an actual function where we show how to add things to the stack. You can run this, OK? C. All we do is add counter D, and that's an object. And object D is destroyed when the function finishes. So we create the function. We add the function into the stack. As it's running, we're creating an object. And then as soon as we're done with that object, the object is dead. It's gone. And so it's destroyed. The heap is the general purpose storage where data remains as long as the application is running. As we add things to the heap, they potentially will stay there unless we destroy them. Now, 
There are things like garbage collection. Has everybody heard the term garbage collection? That was a real big deal with Java, right? Java had a garbage collection system. So if you're you writing code in Java, that garbage collection system would go into the heap and get rid of things. As you created them, you didn't have to worry about destroying them by hand. But if we don't have garbage collection, we are the garbage collectors. We have to be explicit in how we handle um, those items that we're creating. You have to delete them if you create it or we create what? If we're adding things to the heap and we're never getting rid of them, what are we doing? We're making a memory leak. Absolutely. As soon as you add something to the heap and you leave it there, well, guess what? It's going to constantly and continuously use that memory and slowly it's going to fill up and then it's either going to crash the program, it's going to cause unexpected behavior, we're going to run out of resources, we could potentially crash the entire system, right? Has anybody worked with software that had a memory leak? Uh-huh. I see nothing but heads naughty. Everybody knows that at some point you're going to run into that. Uh, famous one, Minecraft. Minecraft server. Uh, last time I was dealing with the Minecraft server, which was two years ago, that one was known for having memory leaks. You'd set up a Minecraft server, you'd let it run for a while, and if you didn't restart your server, at some point Minecraft was going to bring down your entire server. So this is a heap function right here. And what we're doing is we're counter D. And what's that star for? It's pointer. Okay? Just like we were talking about just a little while ago, we're creating a pointer. So we create this object and then we delete the object. But if we did not run delete on that object, that object would exist in the heap and it would stay there and that would be a memory leak. Now for something like this, you'd have to do this function over and over and over a whole bunch of times before we would actually start to see an issue. Like that program would have to continuously run and have access to this memory and stay there for a whole long time. In addition to that, if you do not delete this stuff, by hand, if you are not explicit in this, it will stay after you close the program. Again, no garbage collection, right? We're our own garbage collectors. So if we don't collect that garbage, even as your program is done running and it stops, it will keep that information and continue to use up resources. So the stack is a fixed size while the heap can grow. Remember, memory leak continues to grow, starts to take up more and more space, and eventually we run out of resources. The stack can overflow in what is called a stack overflow, which, of course, that means that it goes straight to the internet and starts posting about all your problems, right? No laughs? I got, I got a laugh, thanks. <laughs> so if there's not enough room on the stack to handle the memory being assigned to it, that's a stack overflow, okay? And again, some languages do provide garbage collection and will free or delete memory from the heap as items fall out of scope. Not all of them do that, and in addition to that, even some languages that do provide garbage collection, depending on the functions that you're using and the stuff that you're doing with that language, potentially you could still end up in a mem uh, memory leak situation. You could still have problems. So regardless of whether the system says it has garbage collection or not, you still want to think about being fairly explicit in your actions and how this stuff is handled. So guess what? We just covered the stack, we covered pointers, we covered the buffer. Easy, right? Everybody here could go out and start working in C immediately. You have the basic concepts and everything that you need to know, and the next thing I know, everybody here will be the next notch, switching straight to Java and creating Minecraft, right? So the next problem is input. Your software is going to bring things in, right? We need some sort of information for that software to work. Sometimes we're really, really lucky and the software only needs to do something that doesn't require any kind of input, but that's not really going to happen. You might have a user providing input, maybe a form, text input box, some place where they can stick something into the computer, right? 
You might have an uploaded file. This one's big with WordPress people. Once WordPress gives people the opportunity to upload files to the server, man, people get real creative with that when they want to attack your WordPress server. Maybe you're piping data into the program. It's a command line interface. You have a CSV file that you're going to pipe directly into your application. Or maybe the data is sent over a network. It's a REST call. You wrote some software and it's going to go out to the internet and contact a server and pull down some information, bring it in, and then work on that data. Okay? No matter what it is or where this data comes from, you cannot trust this data. You just can't. Just make the assumption that at no time this information is ever good. I don't care if you wrote it. I don't care if your mom wrote it, your dog wrote it, anybody. No matter who it is, you cannot trust that information. So what do you have to do? You have to do what's called either input validation or sanity checking is another good one. And so what are we actually doing there? Well, we're looking at the data to see if the data is correct. We don't want to just give you an opportunity. When I say, what is your name? Put your name in this box. Well, maybe your name is 256 characters long. And I'm only looking for 255. And then what happens? We're trying to put more information into a spot than that spot can hold in memory, right? And what happens? The program crashes. Or how about WordPress? They did a huge update not too long ago in which they had to scramble to add support for emojis to WordPress. Do you all know why they had to add emoji support? They had to add emoji support because the database was not designed to handle emojis. And they would literally crash or delete the entire database if you started adding emojis into it. You could corrupt the whole database. You could cause all kinds of problems depending on what you were putting into the database. So somebody would open up a text box, start putting emojis inside of that text box, hit submit, and they would blow the whole site out. And that was such a like emergency thing, they kept it secret. And the way that they announced it was to tell everybody, surprise, we've added emoji support to WordPress. Look at how great we are. You can use the poop emoji now. Isn't that fantastic, everybody? But that wasn't the actual issue they were trying to solve. The issue they were trying to solve was the fact that those emojis were causing problems with the database. And it was interesting, too, because the guy who found this problem, he actually contacted WordPress and was cool about it. He was like, look, look what I can do. Here's the script you can run. I can essentially destroy anything. I can cause all kinds of problems on the internet right now. And they asked him to keep it secret, and he did. The guy followed through. He's a European guy. So that's very lucky, right? To have somebody who sat down and had all of these, essentially, the world open to him. The whole world was his oyster. He figured out how to break something that he could have done horrible things. And instead of sitting down and breaking all of this stuff, what this guy did was to sit down, reach out to the people at WordPress, and hook them up. That was a super cool thing. And of course, I talk about that here. Um, and that'll get into SQL injection and stuff like that here in a little bit. If you're just a real basic recap here, if you're going to accept any information from anybody, if your program has to accept any information from anywhere, you need to sanitize it. In addition to that, you never know what's going to happen on your system or your program or whatever it is that you're working on. So when you output information or you provide that information somewhere else, you should still sanitize that as well. You should make sure that there's some kind of sanity check on both input as well as output. You're looking for problems. You're looking to make sure certain information does not go out. Think about it. If I need to accept your social security number through my form, should my program ever be allowed to print out your social security number if I am not supposed to print it out? No. So I should be checking to make sure 
that at no time am I accessing those social security numbers and then running them to output. When you're developing software, a lot of this is very logical and it's going to consist of you sitting down with a pad and a, a pen and sitting there and saying, what do I need to accept? What do I need to send out? And then what do I need to make sure goes nowhere? And what do I need to make sure never comes in? When you design a form, you're going to set yourself up with what? Some dates, maybe a date of birth, maybe a date of incident, whatever it is, but you've got some dates. Maybe you have some time, you've got some names. But for each one of those things, we're looking for specific stuff. Uh, like, think about names. Anybody here know anybody who has an emoji or a, uh, like a exclamation mark in their name? Anything like that? No, right? Most of us don't. But is it possible that that could happen? Maybe. What about numbers? You and I, probably none of us in here have a number in our name, but somebody could be Richard the Third. And instead of putting in Richard the Third and spelling the whole thing out, what if he just puts in Richard Three? That's my name, Richard Three. So potentially, you have to think about who you're going to handle, who are you going to cater to. I have a coworker who has four names. I have three names. Most of us have three names. If you go down to the DMV, generally you're looking at different forms that have what? First name, middle name, last name. No more, no less. So for somebody like him, he has a big issue when he goes down to some place and tries to use a form and has to put in four names. Do you know how most of these places actually shorten it? They take the first initials of the two middle names and then use that as a name. So like Aaron, B, C, and then the last name of D. They try to find ways of shortening things so that it fits, okay? Your job is to figure out what you will support, what you will not support, and make that clear to the user. Um, we talk about it for a little bit here later on, but a lot of what you're going to be doing, especially uh, when you're dealing with things like a potential to run into um, social engineering, is giving information to your user. If I accept your social security number through my web page, then I should have something that says, if a person calls your phone at your home, we will never ask for your social security number. What have I just done? I have informed my user that I am accepting a social security number and we're adding stars to it and doing all the different stuff that you're supposed to do and so on and so forth. And then we are warning them that if somebody does call and ask for that social, don't give it to them. We don't need it again. Once we have it, it's in a database, it's secure, we're not giving it up. We'll get to that here in a second. This one's fun, and this one's really cool, and I really like race conditions, and that sounds weird and probably kind of a little bit sad, but race conditions uh, occur when multi-threaded applications attempt to access a shared resource without any kind of protection or locking. And if you're taking notes, locking is a term that's very important whenever you want to learn about race conditions, because you can actually lock a thread to work singularly with like a function without allowing another one to step in and take over or stomp. Stomp is another term you'll hear. So let's consider the following code. And what I have right here is, can I make it bigger? Is that, a, is, are we frozen? We're gonna give it a second here. Okay, it's not good. I'm going to try to make this a little bit bigger so everybody can see this is a for loop. And again, this is not an introduction to programming. This is just programming concepts and some of the cybersecurity related stuff that we need to worry about. So, but good news is, is that, are we, are we cool? Okay, cool. So this right up here, this little line of code, a couple of lines right here, this is a for loop. And it looks pretty basic, right? All I'm doing is, 
I'm declaring an integer right here, int space i equals zero. So I said, hey, I need some space for an integer. Make that integer i and assign it a value of zero. And then I say, for as long as i is less than this huge number, right, then go ahead and do i plus plus. So we're incrementing, yep. And that's all we're doing right there for that for loop. And then I'm saying x, maybe I've already declared x further up, equals x plus 1. So let's say that I declared x, made it a 0, so we're doing plus 1. And for every single loop through this, we're adding 1 to x. Really simple, right? However, I want you to think about what would happen if we have two threads attempting to access the above code. That is when we start implementing a race condition. If you have two threads attempting to access the same function, this is where we're going to stomp all over ourselves. Those threads involved can be at any point in the process at any time. This is really important. This is where we're going to start having a problem. This is where x plus 1 can quickly become any number you can possibly think about. Because x is even able to be changed between time of reading x and writing x. So we have no control over x anymore if we have more than one thread hitting this code. So let's break it down. Thread 1 reads x and x equals 7. Thread 1 is going to add 1 to x. We're going to do our increment, right? And that means that we're going to assign x equals 8. That's what thread 1 is attempting to do. Well, during that time, thread 2 steps in, reads x, and says, oh yeah, x is 7. Sounds good. I see x is 7. Even though thread 1 has already said, I want to assign x equals 8. So at this point, thread 1 is under the impression that x is supposed to be 8. Thread 2 just stepped in, still sees, thread, uh, still sees x as 7. Is everybody still following me? OK. Thread 1 then writes 8 to x. But thread 2 still thinks that x is 7. So now thread 2 adds 1 to x. And what does x become? 8. And then thread 2 writes 8 to x. So we just stomped all over x repeatedly. And now imagine that you have more and more threads getting involved, more and more numbers being added to this thing. It's seen x is 8, x is 9, x is 1,000, x is 1 and it's going back and forth, that number is never going to be correct. We're never going to reach the point that we want to be. It's a compounding problem that only gets worse as more threads are introduced. We start adding threads, we start breaking things. Uh, I had a student who his, um, I'm going to use the word dream, his dream was to become a game programmer. So he started learning C++ because he wanted to design a game engine. And I remember him sitting down and showing me his game engine. And what he was doing was using threads. One thread was being used for the graphical user interface, and then another thread was being used for the game itself. And he was attempting to use multiple threads in order to work on this project that he had. But it was actually moving on the screen and breaking. He had all kinds of tearing and a whole bunch of other stuff. And I, I sat down and I asked him, are you using multiple threads? And he said, yes. And I immediately said, well, you need to look into locking, because this is where your, your problem is. You have different things being touched by different um, threads. And lo and behold, by the end of class, he pulled me over and he said, hey, check this out again. And he had it fixed. But when you start working with threads is when you have to be much more careful with your logic, as well as paying attention to what those threads are potentially doing. Um, one other thing. For those of you who do any kind of gaming, have you ever heard that it's better to have a very, very fast processor than it is to have one with multiple cores or threads? Have you all heard that before? A couple of you? OK. This is what's going on in terms of people don't want to code for lots and lots of threads because it's hard. It is. It's hard to learn this stuff. And it's hard to make sure all of this stuff works all at once. So for a lot of these very um, 
very intricate systems that are doing a lot of math and all over the place, they are essentially running off of maybe one or two threads. Nowadays, we're starting to see more and more people move towards multi-threaded applications and getting all that stuff in there. But even today, you'll still find applications that only use one thread. Uh, in addition to that, just as a, and I'm not pushing AMD, but have you all heard about Threadripper? A couple of you? That's going to be cool. I'm super excited about Threadripper. When we're moving towards having 32 threads now in systems or more, the amount of parallel processing that we can do is getting absolutely insane. And Intel is already like super upset about Threadripper and they've said that they're going to throw down the gauntlet here shortly and so stuff is supposed to get even faster. Uh, and a lot of this has to do with the fact that essentially we're reaching sort of this apex of how fast processors are. So what we're having to do is we're moving out to being able to handle more things at once as opposed to climbing. Now we're just spreading out. So here's our next one. Access control failure. Everybody here has worked in access control lifecycle. Everybody. There's not a single person here I am absolutely convinced who has not put a username and a password into a web page at some point and hit submit. That is access control. If you're watching this on YouTube right now, you are part of the access control life cycle. Because you went to YouTube and you clicked on this video and you can see the video and that means that YouTube has granted you access to view this video. And if you didn't have access to it, what's one of the potential warnings that they could give you? If you don't log in, we can't tell whether you're 18 years of age or older, so you don't have access to this video. I'm sure everybody's seen that before. You've got to give us a username, got to give us a password, and give us information about you, or you're not going to be allowed to see something. This is part of privilege escalation. When you are looking at an application, what are you really trying to do when you want to break in? You want access and privilege to do things you're not supposed to do. That's what you're looking for. When we talk about security vulnerabilities, the vast majority of those vulnerabilities that we're looking for are either privilege related or the exploits necessary to gain more privilege. We want access to more things. Anybody ever hear the term root, root the box? I want to get access to a server. I'm going to root the server. And then once I have access to that, I have elevated privileges. And now I can do whatever it is that I want to do on that system. Um, for those of you who have ever done any kind of like system administration, what usually happens when you want to start a service? You sudo up or you run sudo to start the service. The service connects or does whatever work that it is necessary using those pseudo privileges and then what does it do? It relinquishes the privileges to go down to the lowest denominator of what it needs to access, run, and do its job, right? You don't want one of those applications running pseudo the entire time. Um, another example, has anybody ever heard about the guy who got his entire Linux box crypto lockered? No. So I don't have a link to this dude, but what ended up happening after the dust settled, after this guy said, I got crypto lockered through my web browser on a Linux box, wiped out my whole home directory, wiped out the whole system. Okay? What actually happened was is he sudoed up and ran Firefox. And there was an exploit in Firefox that gave whoever accessed that exploit the ability to run code on the system. And so somebody ran CryptoLocker on his system, had root access, started it forward slash, worked its way down, CryptoLockered the whole box. Because what was he doing? He was running as root. So when I tell you most of this stuff is about privilege escalation, what do we really care about? We care about running as that lowest common denominator. Our user should not be root. For some of us, our users shouldn't even be able to sudo up. 
Okay? We want to log into a user to do specific work or to do specific things, and that user should not have the capability to move up into sudo. Uh, I have a, well, I have a bunch of servers. Everybody who knows me knows that I'm a real big scaleways guy, and I think that everybody should have a remote Linux box somewhere out in the world, and so on and so forth, right? I also run a server that's far, and that server is the only way that you can come back into my home network, okay? So I have to go from wherever my computer is all the way out into Europe through SSH, and then once I hit there, then that is the only box that can SSH all the way back into my home, and it gets dropped into a box that can't sudo up. That user has only very limited read access to some resources on my network, and what is that user allowed to do? It can pull down like videos and pictures and all my fun stuff, but it can only read, can't write, can't delete, can't do anything else. It just has read access. So I can grab that information and go throw it out on that server or I can stream it back all the way to my computer through SSH tunneling. There's things that I can do with that information, but I can't get rid of it, can't destroy it, can't break it, can't do anything. Okay? Now that's a lot of work for it to be set up like that, that initial um, I guess brainstorming of deciding what are the things that I'm worried about, what kind of vulnerabilities am I concerned about, so on and so forth. You know, I can only SSH in. I'm not running any kind of like remote administration tools or anything like that. Because why? Because I'm worried about privilege escalation. The less things that this box has access to, the less vulnerabilities that it has, the less software that's running, the harder it is for you to be able to do something with that box. Could somebody get in there and find all my anime? Sure, maybe they could. And then they're gonna have a really cool collection of anime. Oh well. But it doesn't mean that they got into that box and then destroyed all of my records. It doesn't mean that they destroyed all of my um, documentation for like my car or anything like that. What people wanna do is called CRUD. And that's another uh, acronym that you'll want to keep in mind. CRUD being create, read, update, or delete. Okay? That's our concern, is CRUD. What can they create? What can they read? What can they update? What can they delete? If I get into a system and I've broken into that system, what's one of the first things that I'm going to want to go in there and do? Start messing with the logs, right? Updating logs, changing logs, covering my tracks. I don't want you to know that I was in there. I don't want you to know what I was doing. I don't want you to know what access I had. So I'm updating logs. Maybe I'm creating files. Um, we've talked about this before previously, but people break into servers. Why? Because they want to be able to put their kitty porn up. They want to put illegal content on your server and get that hosted out to people. And then if the FBI comes knocking, who are they going to come knocking? They're going to come knocking for you because you're the one who owns the server, not the guy who uploaded all that crap to it, right? That's a concern. We're also going to talk about weak crypto. And this is even worse than no crypto. No crypto is probably not that bad when you think about it because we know that it's not there. We will treat that data differently. We will act differently. We will have different concerns than if we are under the impression that our crypto is good, our crypto is strong, our crypto is working, and then we find out, actually, that crypto sucks, and it doesn't work, and it doesn't do anything, and that whole time that you were just slinging that data all around, well, guess what? Somebody else was able to sit there and just decrypt this stuff as it comes over the wire, and they could look at all of it. Because us, under the impression that it was safe and secure, treated that data differently, and I guarantee it. When you go to a web page and up in the corner it's got a little key lock and it says SSL encryption and so on and so forth and this thing is protected, I almost guarantee every person in this room has so far been trained to look at that and go, yeah, I can put a username and password in that box. And then when we see no crypto and the thing has a little warning and it says there's no crypto available off of this web page, most of us are now trained to look at that and go, nope, you don't get my information. Why don't you go out and get a Let's Encrypt? Even if you're the poorest sysadmin in the world, you can still have a Let's Encrypt. 
So you can still add crypto to that web page, and that's how we see it. Not thinking about the fact that cryptography is not a guarantee of contents. Cryptography means that those contents are encrypted. It does not mean that the contents are true, that they're real, that they're safe, that they're coming from who you thought they came from. None of those are a guarantee with crypto. The only guarantee that you really, even then, you don't really have this guarantee, but the only thing that we can say on a whole that cryptography represents is that the information should be encrypted and nobody should be able to read it, which again, that's false. It's not 100% true, but in general. We're, we're using a generalization here because we can get way into the weeds with crypto and we can get way into the weeds with SSL. But guess what? The bad guys screw this up too. We've all heard, right, of versions of CryptoLocker that were released into the wild and the crypto was no good and people could recover their data without having to pay. It always shows up in the news. This variant or this version of this crypto locker tool fails. It does not provide uh, any kind of good crypto for that information that's being captured. And then somebody can come in, write a script, and they get their data back. If you're going to implement any kind of crypto, uh, one of the main recommendations that you get is no, don't roll your own. Don't create your own cryptographic um, algorithms. Don't create any of that stuff. Always work with what's available. Work with the tools that have already been tried, tested, proven. Uh, that's generally a good, um, good advice. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't work with crypto. Like, uh, if you do any kind of PHP programming, there is actually like a PHP encrypt and a PHP decrypt that's a function, and you can encrypt things and then decrypt those things. You can use those. Like, that's what they mean. You can use the functions that are made available to you. You can write software using the code that's tried and tested by like OWASP and all these other groups. That's fine. That's not what they mean when they say don't roll your own crypto. What they're talking about is writing the actual encryption algorithm that's being developed to do the encryption itself. Now we're going to get into social engineering. And this is where it gets tough. Okay? Because at the end of the day, no matter how hard you work to make your software secure, no matter how much effort you put in to defending your database, to defending your network, to defending your server, any and all of these things. I don't care what you're doing to try to protect yourselves. If you as a user make a mistake, or you as a user give out this information, you're cooked. It doesn't matter. You can have the best crypto in the world, but if your users sit down and hand over their username and password to somebody who picks up the phone and says that they're from Microsoft support, you can't help them. There's nothing that you can do as a user. However, this is where education comes in. This is why we have classes like this. This is why when I'm speaking to people on behalf of the police department, I go out there and I tell them, hey, if you're a little kid and you're interested in doing Minecraft, and that's great and that's super cool, but hey, kids, make sure that you're not putting your picture online. Don't be going out there and giving out your username and password. Don't tell people where your parents live. Because some of these people don't know. They're either young or they're not experienced with it or they don't know where these things can be used as weapons or to harm someone. Again, going back to some of my earlier comments. How does it help us? How does it hurt us? We can have fun with it or we can hurt somebody with it. I can create a tool that's going to harm you, or I can t create a tool that'll let you have some fun. But it's all off of the computer. We need, as developers, whether you're a web application developer, whether you write software, whether you're doing uh, any kind of integrated or um, any kind of development, you know what, just any, you need to start educating your users. When they fill out a form, you need to warn them. You need to let them know within the form. And I know it seems redundant when you 
have users who get really upset because they have to have a letter, a number, their password can't be the letter A, and they get super upset about it, and oh, you're wasting my time, why can't I just use the letter A, it's just my bank account, it's not like you guys won't pay me back anyways if they steal my money. When you are dealing with folks, it does help to make them feel empowered, to give them information that says, your password must be this link, this link, this link, and then at the bottom, just link them to the, the government. If you'd like to know more about why we choose to make our passwords of this strength, here's a little link. Click on it, takes them to the FBI with a little breakdown of your password's important. Feel good stuff. And some people will never click on it, and some people get upset, and other people will just use forgot my password every single time they come to the web page. And that may be just their MO. But for every person that we can help or empower, that's important. And of course, this is getting into that touchy-feely, like, oh, we're software developers. Like, I should just be able to write code. And if you're too stupid to use this, then just, well, oh, well. But how many people here deal with people who have said, I've got a camera that I went out and bought, and I brought it in my house, and that's my security camera, and all I did was turn it on, and now I can connect to it with my phone. And all that stupid networking stuff you said I was going to have to do, I don't have to do that. I, right? I see a bunch of head shaking. Mm -hmm. You have that relative that said, oh, all that internet stuff that you're getting paid for, that's dumb. You press a button on your cell phone, boom, there it is, video of my house. And then you have to sit there and you have to explain to them, actually, that video of you walking around in your house in your underwear is first being shipped off to China where they're using it for things, whatever it is that they've decided that they want to use it for. And then that data is being shipped all the way back overseas, and then it ends up on your phone. And in addition to that, your phone or that device in your home is being used to crunch numbers, break crypto, mine Monero, or whatever else it is that they've decided that that system is going to be used for. Or you get a knock on the door and a letter delivered to you that says, hey, we're cutting off your internet because your whole house is part of a botnet. And so you can't be on the internet anymore until you fix it. Any of those things could be potentially going on. And it's real hard as a developer to try to explain that to somebody who is not developer minded when you tell them, yeah, that $99 or $150 that you just spent on this kit for your home is still being used by somebody else. Somebody has access to all of this information. Somebody's using it. It's being deployed all over the place. And they look at you and they get upset. Well, why didn't you tell me that? Well, I tried to. That's why I said we've got to set up your network correctly and we've got to do all this other stuff. But a lot of people don't want to hear that. That's where the whole social engineering thing comes in. We as developers, we as application developers, we as whatever it is that we're doing, we have to sit down and we have to start making this clear to people. And guess what? There are new kids being made every single day and this is not a waste because maybe that one person that you were worried about has just learned to click on that little FBI button, read, and then make their password. But there's another person who's just turned in 12 that's going to head over to that web page and they've never heard any of this stuff before. And it's going to continuously be a benefit as it churns through new people. And I know I commented about the social security part, but let's talk about that again because this is important. Because what is, what is toxic? Data is toxic. What do people love to hoard? Data. Whatever your information is. They want information about your house, your car, your shoes, your what you know, color shirt you like to wear. Any of this information, they want to keep it. It's all toxic information. It's not good for a whole lot other than harming people, but they want to keep it. Anybody want to give me a database that got hit that was full of toxic information? Ashley, Ashley Madison, toxic information, right? They promised, they literally promised, hey, you slip me a fiver and I'll delete your name. And they took their fiver and they didn't delete the name. Toxic information. Not just toxic, purposefully toxic. Can you imagine what could be done with that information? Well, guess what? I'll tell you. People killed themselves. Marriages were ended. Divorce court went different ways. There's three items right there. 
Okay? They had priests whose names were on that list with their address and with all the other information, and people found out that they were sitting there surfing Ashley Madison from their parish who decided to off themselves, then have to face the shame of having their information put out there. Okay? Toxic information, harmful data. Again, social engineering. How do you tell people the things that you're doing on the computer are harmful to you and others? And if you are not educated about these things, you are going to cause yourself or others problems. And I, I have met people, when you tell them, hey, that device in your house is being used to DDoS somebody's server, they go, I don't care, it doesn't affect me. My computer's not slow. Screw them. There are people who are either willfully ignorant or just don't care. So we're also dealing with those folks. Tool tips, okay? Just tool tips. Inform people, educate them, be a mouthpiece. Be a software developer, be a security guy, be whatever you gotta be, but let people know. And then here's another really powerful one. Failure to expect attacks. It'll never happen to me. I'll never be involved in that. You know what tools I don't use still to this day? Won't touch them? Adobe. You know why? Because they burned me twice. Adobe got hit, and I had one of those stupid Adobe Cloud accounts. So I got hit in the Adobe Cloud account. And all my information got leaked to the internet. And if you go and you check for leaks, and you start throwing my email and my information in, you can actually find my data in that stupid Adobe account. And then they send out an email that said, oh, everything's cool. We fixed it all. Don't worry about it. You can go right back to using Photoshop and using these video editing tools, and everything's going to be OK. Adobe has got your back. And like a moron, I said, well, I had to cancel my credit card. I had to do all this other stuff. But I really need access to Photoshop, and i got to be able to work on all these different things. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and sign right back up for Adobe. And no more than a few months later, what do I get? Hey, just so you know, Adobe got popped again. All your information right back out on the internet. Ha <laughs> ha, cancel your credit card immediately. Thanks, Adobe. You guys literally kept toxic data in your server, credit card information, my name, date of birth, all of this other data. You kept that toxic data. You got popped, leaked it all to the internet, Instead of sitting down and saying, you know what, how do we get better at PCI compliance? How do we get rid of this toxic data? How do we remove these dangers from our users? Somebody just said, we'll just restart the server. They won't come back. It'll be fine. Once we bounce that database up and down, that whoever's connected to the REST API or whatever it was that they were plowing through that thing with, they'll just disconnect and they will never reconnect ever again. And they just through all the data, right back out on the internet. Expect attacks. If you want to get super Harry Potter in here, constant vigilance, right? Pick whatever it is that you want to pick to get yourself in that mindset, but understand that at all times, the tools help. They give you access to Photoshop. The tools hurt. They force you to go out and cancel your credit card, or else somebody's going to go and do stupid stuff with your money. There's a, lot of web, um, there's a lot of businesses. There are a lot of people in government. Can anybody think of a government agency that got hit, had all their toxic data leaked out onto the internet, and caused a whole bunch of us problems, especially those of us who were either in the military or working with the military? Anybody want to give me a three-letter OPM? Do you know how that worked out for them? Essentially, they spent that much money on security, zero dollars, no money. They spent no money on security. They found a guy in their systems, saw that he was operating with the computer, and when people said, we got to take this network down, we got to figure out what's going on, we need to resolve these issues, you know what they did? They said, it's cool, we'll watch. He's not going anywhere. He's just rooting around in the system. He's not going to pull any data out. And they went with a hands-off approach. I want you to imagine for a second that you're in your home, and you hear 
boom, and in goes your front door. And a guy walks in, and he's got a bag in one hand, a mask on, and a gun in the other, and he's just cruising around your house, just looking. How many of you are going to look over at your husband or wife? And don't worry, I'm talking to the camera too. How many of you are just going to look over and be like, hey, it's cool. He hasn't picked anything up. Just leave him alone. He's just cruising around. He's just looking. It's not a big deal. No, right? Nobody's going to sit there and say, it's fine for you to be in my network. It's fine for you to be in my computer. It's fine for you to be in my house. It's not fine. But that's what they did. And then they aren't even the ones that sounded the alarm. It was a contractor who found out that their information was now out. There was traffic moving. There was data being pulled down. People were able to find this information on the internet. And that's when somebody stepped in and was like, well, I guess it's time for us to tell somebody. And guess what? By that point, CRUD, right? Create, read, update, delete. What happened? Somebody in the database started updating records, deleting records, reading the records. There, are, there is a potential right now that in the OPM database, there are individuals registered as retirees of the US military who do not exist, but there is money being paid out to these individuals. And they have no way of verifying whether that information is true or not. OK? So there is potential right now that within that database, somebody has added a guy, said that he's a retiree, and somebody is collecting money for that retired individual, the person does not exist. And there is no way for them to go in there and verify. Because what are you going to do? Cut off everybody in the US's retirement? You're going to just shut it all down? Hey, thanks for your service, but we got to shut this down because our database sucks. Go reset your credit card. And then they go, what, lockstep, hand in hand with Adobe, off into the sunset? No, it's not going to happen. So they pay it out. Software development for penetration testers. This is where it starts getting cool, right? Now that we're all super depressed and extra mad, getting ready to go home and get on the internet and start posting, right? We're going to go hit those forums. Lots and lots of applications available, OK, for penetration testers. I've made lists. You have links. There's a German Python list. So if you like to work with Python, there's tons and tons of penetration tester tools available. Uh, and it's not in German. It just so happens to be um, curated by some people from Germany. That's why it's called the German Python list. So don't worry. Everything here is in English, OK? There's a pen testers framework. The awesome list of GitHub things is actually what it's called. It is the awesome list of GitHub things. Um, let me see if I got it pulled up here somewhere. I might, I might not. Uh, yep, Python pen test tools. So there's huge, you want to be able to work with networks, here it is. Debugging, there it is. Reverse engineering, we've got it. Fuzzing, you can do it. Web, forensics, malware analysis, got to deal with PDFs, uh, tons of miscellaneous stuff, all kinds of libraries and tools, even books. Okay, So talk, slides, loads of stuff. It's all curated for you. So if you're interested in becoming a penetration tester, if you're interested in doing software, if you want to learn more about secure software development, you have everything that you need here, step by step, for you to be able to go through and start learning about the things that you're interested in. <sighs> Pen testers framework, right there. Okay, More information on that. And then, of course, the curated list of awesome lists. We've got a curated list of lists. So you can go through here and get super meta as much as you want. You've got gaming, editors, books, theory, big data, security, content management systems, decentralized systems. You want to start learning about uh, machine learning, anything like that. Just tons and tons of links. Now, does anybody notice what tool I'm using? I know you notice. What do I like? What do I tell all my students to get? What do you guys got to register? That's right, GitHub. Get a GitHub, even if you're not a developer. Even if you yourself are not a developer, it's fine. Register yourself a GitHub and start using GitHub. You can put anything on there. 
I put fan fiction. I literally sit down and write fan fiction and put it up on GitHub. I use it as a version control and storage for stories that I write. They don't care, don't worry. You can use GitHub for anything that you want. GitHub is a fantastic tool. Every student that comes through my classes, what do I tell them? I tell them to get themselves a GitHub. I teach them how to push content to GitHub, pull content down from GitHub, how to clone things. I give them these concepts because they are some of the most important things that you can learn as a person who uses the computer. If you're using the computer, GitHub is an invaluable tool. I can't recommend it enough. Okay? And this isn't hyperbole. This isn't me just getting crazy about GitHub because I want you to use it because I'm going to get $5 for every person who signs up. This is real deal. If you want to start learning this stuff, this is the place you can go for this information, okay? Hey, look at that. Awesome pen testing. Here's all the resources that they have for penetration testing. Look at that. It just goes on and on and on. And it just keeps going on until you get all the way to the bottom. You can get on there, control F, start looking for keywords about things that you want to learn about, and they will have information there. Tons of people who are contributing to this. So I'm going to start shutting some of these. And then that gets us to there. Great. Lots of stuff, right? And then here in a minute, we're also going to go over places that you can go to to actually start learning computer programming. And uh, if you live here in Arizona, most of your cities will actually provide you with free training on computer programming. And we'll get to that here in a second as well. So what about jobs? Lots of jobs are going to require software developers. But in addition to that, one of the issues that a lot of us are going to run into is the fact that many of us will not have security clearances. And that's where it gets tough, especially for those of us who say, I want to work in cybersecurity. I want to be a cybersecurity person, but I don't have a security clearance. It's tough. It's tough on anybody who doesn't have a security clearance. But let's think about this. Who had a security clearance? Edward Snowden? That guy had a security clearance, right? Did that do him a lot of good? Guess it depends on who you ask, right? How about Reality Winner? NSA contractor? I'm sure everybody knows about her, right? We've talked about her in here before. What was she? A self-proclaimed resistor and Bernie Sanders supporter. And it was on her uh, social media that said that I'm going to resist the government. I resist. I'm a resistor. I'm going to shut it all down. I'm going to fight back. So she had a security clearance while having in her background information that literally said, I'm going to punch the government straight in the eye. So how much do you think those security clearances do in terms of good? Not a whole lot. Okay. People are starting to see this. There's pushes right now to revamp how um, security clearances are managed. There are pushes right now from a lot of companies to look outside of. Now, in general, for you to have a security clearance, you have to have previously had military experience and then had a position that allowed you to keep your clearance. Because if you allow your clearance to lapse, eventually you lose it. You have to reapply for it. There's a lot of work that goes involved that is involved in security clearances, and it is a huge headache for all members involved, whether it's the person who has it the job that needs to be able to keep you up to date with that security clearance, the amount of money that's spent, which goes where? OPM. Who did what? Gave away all your information. So that was great, right? We have security clearances that people paid 70 plus thousand dollars for. For why? So it could go into a database that then they gave to some foreign actor. Okay, well that's cool. So that's, that's the pinnacle of cybersecurity here. This is where we're at. Bizarro world, right? In addition to that, you're going to run into HR offices that don't understand what you're doing. Uh, when I sit my students down and we talk about penetration testing, I talk about continuous integration. 
I talk about automation. I talk about, OK, we're going to write an SQL query. Great. So what are we going to do with that SQL query? We're going to also write tests to send bad data to that query so that at the point where we get done checking in our query and we push it up to GitHub, GitHub spawns a Docker box and actually tests the database for us. It takes a copy of the database and sends bad data. It sends incorrect information to that SQL query. It sends all of this stuff and at the end it goes, yeah, everything here came back with what we expected. Expected behavior. It might break it. It might fail. But it was expected that it would fail. It was expected that it was broken. Just because something fails, breaks, or returns with error doesn't mean that we were wrong. Right? It just means that we saw what we expected. We got what we wanted back. I can't play this here because it's super obnoxious, but this is um, approximately 35 minutes of Steve Ballmer screaming the word developers over and over again. It's fantastic. If you haven't seen it, it'll get you super pumped for coding. Okay, put it on repeat, sit there, just code away. Code your heart out as Steve Ballmer just screams developers over and over and over again. Um, now let's get into a little bit of information about training. I've got tons of links here. Learn C. Hey, look at that, a web page where we can learn all about C. What's this? C programming for beginners. A whole bunch of information there. We have a, uh, no thanks. Please stop. Thank you. We have an ultimate list of resources to learn C and C++. We have C tutorials. And this can actually be pulled down as a PDF if you go further down in there. And then Linda. And I'm going to pause on Linda for a second. Because if you have a uh, library card, you have access to Linda. That's training videos. That's everything. The complete Linda package is made available to you if you get yourself a library card. That's all you need. So for anybody who's sitting in this room or watching this right now who say, well, I can't just learn off a of text can't just hand me a PDF and I can't learn this stuff. If you want videos, if you want a structured learning format for learning coding, for learning skills, business, photography, any of that stuff, you can use Linda free of charge as long as you go get yourself a library card. Chandler is, get, Chandler is guaranteed, not Tempe. So not Tempe, Chandler is guaranteed. So get yourself a Chandler one. Not sure. I know for Chandler for sure because that, and that, that's where you got yours. So uh, I got mine through Chandler, and that gave me access to all of that stuff. So get yourself one. I'm a huge fan of Vim. Everybody knows I love Vim. I push Vim all the time. This is Vim Adventures. You can learn Vim while playing a game. So you sit down, and you play a role-playing game, and you just use Vim to complete the role-playing game. And it teaches you the Vim skills. I show it to everybody because, again, I'm a big Vim guy. I don't know if anybody remembers, but a lot of my early talks were about Vim, teaching people how to play games in Vim and connect to you know, REST APIs with Vim and doing all kinds of crazy stuff with Vim. Love Vim. Vim is great. Guess what? Free classes. Here's another one. If you want to learn Ruby, if you're looking for a scripting language and you need Rails and you want to start getting yourself familiar with Ruby, there's Rails for zombies. There's themes. There's fun things. You know, they've got cute little ponies and all this other stuff up here, but it gets kind of like, ooh, spooky. Spooky, spooky skeletons, right? Uh, I'm a big proponent of learning at least one traditional programming language, C, C++, Java, I don't care what it is, and one scripting language. Uh, in my classes, I usually focus on C++ and Bash. Those are the two things that I show my students, and those are the two things that I get them familiarized with. And a lot of that has to do with because of the fact that I want them to learn about like the difference between an integer and a character, or the difference between um, a bool and a long. Like, I want them to get themselves familiar with a lot of concepts that maybe in their language of choice they're not going to entirely use, 
but they need to at least keep it in mind. Okay? Because what happens in PHP? We declare a variable and we add a value to that variable, but do we ever have to worry about like it's an integer or it's a character? No, it doesn't matter. PHP is a scripting language and what do we do? We just say, we just declare a variable and we throw information into it and that's it. That's all you have to do. Look, the show goes on and on. Check I.O., another place to learn. Code Combat, this one's fun. You can go to Code Combat, this one's great for kids. It teaches them how to write software so that a little man or a little monster goes into a room, has to traverse the room, and then at the end hits somebody with a sword. But it's giving you concepts and teaching you the basics. So if you want to go super hardcore and learn the old-fashioned way and get yourself that Bjorn Strawstrap, you know, blue and white book and just pound away at that, that's fine. Or if you want to sit down and learn how to do it using graphics and stuff, you can do that too. I see some Macs in here. Anybody who's running a Mac, uh, Apple has learning to code programs that are available inside of the Apple Store that are completely free. And in addition to that, uh, you can pack up your Apple stuff and you can go down to the Apple Store and they actually have learn to code classes uh, that they give for free as well. So nobody has an excuse, okay? Literally nobody in here has any kind of excuse in terms of, well, it's too expensive to learn anymore or it's too hard. As long as you have a computer, the internet, and access to one of these web pages or even the Apple Store, you can learn to code. But even with all this cool stuff, do you all remember Marcus? Marcus Hutchins? He was a security researcher who stopped WannaCry. Now I'm going to make some inflammatory statements here, but before I do that, I just want to say I'm talking for myself, not for the PD. I'm a representative of myself, not of Chandler. And everything that I say is my opinion and not anybody else's, okay? So now that we've got that out of the way, I want to start talking about this guy. There was a huge uproar because he went to DEF CON 2017 and the FBI <coughs> showed up as he tried to leave and yanked this guy up. So they're claiming that he created and distributed Kronos. And I have links in here that takes you to a little picture of Marcus. He's, where is he? He's in here somewhere. Hey, there he is. Hey, Marcus. So we have Marcus here. Okay, this is the guy that got picked up. He's the wanna cry hero, all right? And he got stopped by the FBI, and so there's lots of information here for you all to decide how you feel about this. Kronos was known as an application that was designed, developed, and distributed to steal credit card information, banking information, and financial data. Okay? If you got this thing added to your system, it'd pull information from your computer, send it back to a command and control center, and then people could do financial crimes using this tool. That's what he got picked up and accused of. The actual charges include creation and distribution of tools being used to steal bank account information, accessing and damaging computers he is not authorized to use, and wiretapping. These are really interesting charges because they're probably not going to stick. Okay? He distributed software. It's really hard as a lawyer to say that that's wiretapping if he didn't install it on your computer himself. Like, if I came to you and I added a bug to your phone, potentially I could be hit for wiretapping because I did it. I went in there, I added the bug, I sat there and I listened. That's actual wiretapping. But if I made a bug and put it there and somebody came along and gave me 20 bucks and bought that bug and then went and put it on somebody else's phone, it's really hard to say that that's wiretapping. Just like with firearms, one of the big things that they try to do is well, I want to sue the manufacturer of the gun because the gun was used to shoot somebody. But that in court has been defeated several times. They've tried it, but it doesn't really work. So I don't think that these charges are going to stick. Now the next thing is, is I think that the reason why these charges were introduced, and this is all just me, but the reason why I think was to stop him 
from getting out of the country because he has more to do with the wanna cry, wanna crip stuff than they let on. Now, I'm gonna give you an example. Who do you think has the highest rate of being an arsonist? What group of people? Firefighters. And what happens? A firefighter will go in and start a fire and then call it in and say, there's a fire. And then he'll jump in the back of his truck and run in with all of his buddies and they'll save the day. And what is he? He's a hero. He's a major hero. What do you see when you're an officer and you're sitting in your car and you're cruising and you look over and there's Robbie Rotten, the gangster, and he's riding on his pink bicycle. And so you pull over and you go, Robbie, where'd you get that pink bicycle, man? And he goes, oh, it, you, man, I was in an alley and I saw it and it was under a whole bunch of stuff and there was trash all over it and it was completely covered. So what I did was I cleaned it all up and then I jumped on it and I was riding out to find a police officer right now so I can turn this bike over because I'm a hero. And you see it over and over and over again, okay? So in my mind, when I look at this, you had essentially every single security operations center, every single major computer security group stood up when WannaCry went down. It was using Eternal Blue. It was doing all of this stuff. It hit the NHS, Na National Healthcare Services, over there in Britain hard. They were literally having to stop surgeries because the tools stopped working. This was a panic situation to the max. You have all of these people standing around trying to figure out how to stop this thing. And then this no-name guy jumps in and registers a URL, stops the whole thing dead in its tracks. And he gets up and he says, I'm a hero. I saved everybody. That seems odd to me. And I'm not saying that it is unknown for just some rando person to be able to beat out essentially every single major cybersecurity group in the entire world who all had eyes on this thing. But doesn't that seem like a huge embarrassment to you? Doesn't that seem like a huge issue with what we as security researchers are doing? If within moments of this thing getting out, this quote unquote no name kid had access to that code in his parents' house. He had already spun up the stuff to monitor the system, immediately identified a URL, and had this thing on lock. And nobody else did? That's interesting to me. That's strange. That seems like an odd situation. And in addition to that, that's a huge black eye and a massive embarrassment for any of these individuals who are involved in cybersecurity to be beat out that way. Could you imagine if you were the, the person writing the check every month for the millions of dollars that you're paying out to one of these major cybersecurity firms to do active network intrusion detection and artificial intelligence controlled, intel, uh, whatever the buzzword of the day is, but they're always constantly making different stuff that they're selling, right? All these groups are doing it, Dell, uh, Sophos, whoever. What's that? IBM, they've all got like all these tools and we're forking out millions of dollars for these tools, but all it took was a kid in his basement at his mom's house to knock all of that out. Man, it's a big deal, right? And then you find out that he's involved in Kronos, and then you find out that he was involved in Alpha Bay and Hansa Market. We'll get into that here in a second. Then you start finding out that shortly after he got arrested, guess what happened to all the Bitcoins that were put into a wallet as part of the ransom that was paid out for some of these computers? Immediately emptied. He gets popped. Short while later, after all of this time of that money not being touched, this kid finally gets arrested and all that money gets yanked out. That's a very interesting choice of when you're gonna pull your money. So Kronos was sold on Alpha Bay and Hansa dark web markets. What did we talk about in here? We talked about Hansa and we talked about dark web markets. That was our last class. If you came here for that, then you'll remember that I discussed that individuals using Bitcoin 
were going on the internet and they could buy heroin and they could buy auto injectors and they could buy all kinds of narcotics and sex slaves and all these different things and we kind of went on a safari through the internet like all the deep dark crevices to sort of see what people are doing well guess what the Dutch looked at Hansa market and they said we've got that we'll take care of that and they picked up the phone and they called the US and they said hey we just captured the Hansa market we're gonna keep it totally on the down low anybody who's located in the US that we can figure out is using this thing we're just gonna start shipping you their information so you guys can start arresting them so make a list and that's what they did so the US and the Dutch in conjunction got together started knocking over these web pages keeping them up and running letting people use them to buy and sell illicit goods track these individuals and immediately start going out and busting them just recently and if you go to these web pages that I actually have linked from here so who knows maybe I'm on a list too <laughs> you never know but they have seized the sites okay so the sites are seized they're shut down people on reddit are freaking out all the dark markets have said hey guys cool it don't be buying heroin for a little bit because we don't know what markets are okay and which ones are not there's a whole bunch of stuff happening in these markets right now okay and I've got a link to the law enforcement operation so if you want to read about it it's super interesting and it's in there and when you guys have time on your own feel free to sit there and just read about what really went on with this because this is what's happening all over and I want to make it clear we've already talked about this it's not hard to really start unmasking these sites when you think about it because nobody's really using these sites what are they being used for illicit stuff when I got on there to do that class I couldn't find you a single cat meme I couldn't find you a single funny picture I couldn't find you quotes from the Bible but what could I find you I found you heroin, I found you drugs, I found you little kids being forced into sex slavery out in Europe. I can find you any of that stuff, and that's what's on those sites. So either we start cleaning up the streets and improving the neighborhood, or we're going to have a big problem when they finally get up in front of Grandma and they say, look at all this filth, what do you want to do with it? And she says, pass a law to shut all that down. Nobody can use Tor and VPNs and all that stuff. We're going to start making it illegal so we can start kicking in doors. Why? Because there are no cat memes, no recipes for cookies. There's nothing on there. It was all bad stuff. And in addition to that, the guy who essentially wrote the stuff for making those kind of servers was at DEF CON, and he essentially said the same thing. So I beat out his talk by literally a couple of days where I said hey there's nothing good on there and he was like yeah there's not a whole lot of stuff on there <laughs> and what is on there isn't very good so we're gonna look at some of these answers coders develop the tools we use every day right if you're a software developer what are you doing you're making tools people are gonna use them so make sure that you're paying attention to some of the problems that are out here in the world OWASP is an organization that provides unbiased information about internet and computer applications. I use the term unbiased, not entirely unbiased, but unbiased, okay? I leave it up to you to get your own biased opinion about whether or not you like OWASP. The testing phase. When we start working on code and testing, and I kind of mentioned it with the continuous integration and things like that, we can constantly test code. So use that testing phase to also look for security problems. Don't just look to see if the user's name come back, comes back correctly. Also use that time to make sure that only the user's name can come back, that that user's name is sanitized, that nothing else can come from there, and that there is some kind of warning to let you know if somebody did figure out a way to get this thing to spit out a social security number. We want to look for those problems, keep them in mind, and try to cover as much as we can. They call it code coverage. And you'll see it sometimes, you're on a GitHub account, and it'll say there is 87% code coverage for this. And that means that they're trying to, to cover as many functions, as, as many tools, with as many tests as they possibly can. Okay? A buffer overflow happens when software tries to continue writing past the start or end of the buffer. For many of us who, was in, who are in this class, when I was talking about stack and buffer and things like that at the very beginning of the class, I bet that was sort of a foreign concept. But by now, we've all got an idea, right? 
Candy goes in the bowl. The bowl is my buffer. I can reach in there. The candy is my stack. I'm pulling out little pieces of candy and I'm using them. Easy as that. Just a very basic breakdown. And dry stands for don't repeat yourself. Make functions. Follow the coding standards. Do what you need to be able to do to write testable code. I have a function. What does that function do? One thing. That function does not print and SQL and format and so on and so forth. That function does one thing, one thing well, and I test for as many problems as I possibly can off of that single function. Dry. Don't repeat yourself. Just make sure you pay attention to each one of these items. So obviously, software development skills are so important for security researchers, network engineers, and more. People are constantly coming out and saying, we need more coders, right? And people go, well, if we have more coders, that really dilutes the surface. It doesn't, believe me, because most people are not looking or thinking about this stuff. You have a lot of people who are jumping into coding because it's an idea of, I can do coding, I can grab Bootstrap, I can grab a copy of WordPress, and I'm throwing up plugins in no time. Okay? And they're not thinking about how any of this stuff works security-wise. They're not thinking about what they're putting themselves at risk of. None of that. We need good coders. We need good cybersecurity experts who know the code inside and out. The jobs that are going to necessitate having some sort of software engineering or software development background are going to shrink. They're just going to continue to shrink. So learn yourself one traditional programming language and at least one scripting language. I'm telling you, if you can learn Perl, Bash, Ruby, Python, and grab yourself a copy of the GCC and do a little bit of C programming, even those basic concepts will serve you for a long time. Uh, also, closed off source code and uh, walled off systems, we need to remove those from the landscape. They got to go. Uh, we need open source software, and we need all of you to be able to look at it. Here's a question for you all. Who here, raise your hand if you have read every single line of code in the Linux kernel. No? But it's open source, right? So somebody's reviewed it, but not a single person in here has. That's a problem. It's a huge problem. Because who's going to sit down and review that code? Does anybody here feel confident enough to say that if they were actually to start tomorrow and sit down and started reviewing the kernel, that you would feel confident in knowing that your skill set puts you at a level where you could review that code and actually find problems? Yeah. No. It takes a lot of work, a lot of effort, and people are still finding problems in software all over the place. Eternal Blue, SMB version 1.0, that's like 1996. That problem's existed since 1996, and not a single person got up and fixed that. What are my recommendations? Use Linux. Use Linux all day. Always be Linux. ABL, OK? Always be Linux. Learn yourself your programming languages. Do some skill crossing. Get familiar with this stuff. Register your GitHub and some, contribute to some projects. OK? I, can't t I, I, I keep getting the same question from people. Constantly, I get phone calls. Hey, man, what do I need to do to kickstart my, my, my career? What do I need to do? Do you have a GitHub? No. Didn't you take my class? Yeah. Why didn't you get a GitHub? Well, I mean, I don't want to have to actually like put in work. Like, I just want money. <laughs> get yourself a GitHub. Start contributing to projects. Look at open source software. Learn from other people. Look at their code. Do you know where I started when I started with GitHub? I started by going and finding projects that I like that were written by people with poor English skills and translating their documents to good English. That is where I began. And, I would, and that taught me how to do pull requests, how to interact with other people on GitHub, how to work with issues, how to make issues, how to reference things, how to work with Markdown, and how to work with documentation. And that's where I started, helping people translate their stuff from Chinese or from uh, German or from any of these other languages and turning it into something that didn't look like they just ran the words through a meat grinder. And I got stars and hearts and people would say thanks. 
and it gave me skills. You can do the exact same thing, even if you're not a coder. Start with documentation. That's where you can begin. And then pay attention to what software you're using. Choose open source. So we're almost done. I got like five minutes. Does anybody have any questions, comments, anything else that I can answer? No? I really, uh, yeah. For education, uh, actually on the way home I was driving and I just create a X account and I do some of the lectures, actually pretty good. Oh, okay, which, which? edX oh, okay so the the comment was made that this individual here created an edX account and was listening to some of the stuff on the way home and that those are good lectures so that's another opportunity another place for you to listen and um, I guess I should mention that if you have the ability to run some of these lectures in the car while you're listening I mean that's the oldest trick in the book right well, when I was learning investing I had a bunch of investing books on audio tape and I would listen to them in the car while I drove to work exact same thing so you can take this stuff, and what can we do? YouTube DL, right? We go to YouTube, YouTube DL, one of the videos that we want to be able to listen to, use FFmpeg and strip all the audio out, turn it into an MP3, put it on a USB drive, and shove it into your car, right? We're all computer programmers in here, software developers, systems engineers. We should all be able to use Bash and pull down a copy of a video off of YouTube and yank the audio out of it so that you can have it to listen to. I've got two scripts in my GitHub that you would find that allow you to do just that under my uh, dot files. So if you go to GitHub and hit my dot files, you'll actually see this is how you pull video and strip out the audio all at the same time off of GitHub with a single command called music rip, because I only use it for like talks and open source stuff. Sure, absolutely. So the question was, should we have exposure or skills in SQL or SQL? Absolutely. Databases, very important. Get familiar with them. Understand what is going on in the background of that database. Uh, so case in point, WordPress search is not good. If you've ever used raw WordPress search, it sucks. It's super terrible. So we had a problem with that at my job. So I went and I started learning about Elasticsearch. And then I learned about a plugin that allows you to work with Elasticsearch very easily inside of WordPress. And so I added an Elasticsearch server. And then I added that plugin and I worked with it internally. And I got all of those queries ready. And now we do optical, optical character recognition on all of our PDFs and all of our other stuff. And it all gets popped into Elasticsearch. And so as things get added on our network, we can search all that stuff. And it just comes from getting the exposure to learning about different tools and different stuff that's out there in the world, getting familiar with it, making it available to yourself, and then deciding, is this something that I can work with? Is it something I can deploy? And can I work with it like maintenance-wise? Can I take care of this thing? And guess what? For the first week, it didn't work because I didn't have enough CPUs and I didn't have enough RAM and I was crashing the server and I couldn't figure out what I was doing. And it took me a little while of reading documentation familiarizing myself with the actual config files, the .yaml, and learning. And eventually, we added more CPU, added more RAM. I got all the configurations correct. And then after extensive testing, the thing works. And we can look inside of PDFs. And we can look inside of all of our documents. And we can see, because of that OCR, all of the stuff that we're uploading. And we can search by that stuff. So yes, that whole long story turns into Start learning about all of the tools, anything that you can. Learn about your SQL, learn about your Elasticsearch, learn about any of this stuff, because it is going to be a benefit to you regardless. Anything else? Because I'm going to shut it down. Uh, are you going to dinner? No, because then I'm not either. So there is a dinner that is available at BJ's. I'm not going to be able to go, uh, but if you all want to go so you can do some networking, feel free to do so. If you don't, that's OK too. But I would recommend that you all talk amongst each other for a few seconds just to make sure that not just one person shows up. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming out. I really appreciate the fact that you were here. And if there is anything else that I can do for you, do not hesitate to reach out to me. So thank you.